good evening everybody uh, welcome back to this fourth day of the p4 uh, question based revision session um, uh, we have had a very good three days uh, up till now and uh, <clears throat> Okay, so we have had three days uh, of uh, sessions where uh, what have we discussed up till now is we have gone through the uh, we have gone through the risk uh, management of the currency risk management. We have gone through uh, the uh, mergers and acquisitions area. So up till now we have attempted various questions, and uh, in those questions we have tried to uh, we have tried to go through these specific areas now. Today is the final session of this uh, webinar, and uh, I would try to ensure that uh, I cover up um, uh, different areas and I cover up uh, various questions from the different areas. So that's what I would actually try to do. Uh, let's actually start off. <clears throat> you people do have uh, access to the. Uh, you people do have access to the uh, handout uh, that we have been using uh, for this uh, uh, webinar. So, uh, if you could please uh, refer to that specific uh, handout again, uh, because I'm actually gonna uh, I'm gonna perform I like, gonna attempt the question from that specific uh, handout only. Okay. <clears throat> So the first question that I would try to attempt today <clears throat> is basically this um, question of uh, a specimen exam of September 2018. The name of the question is basically Bureau Company. So I would try and I would try and attempt uh, this specific question first. The name of the question is Bureau Company. Uh, let's just start discussing about this bearing company that what exactly is there in this uh, bearing company. Let's discuss. <clears throat> now before I move on to this bearing company, I am actually going to discuss the concept of I'm actually going to discuss the concept of adjusted present value. <clears throat> Okay, let's just start discussing about the concept of this adjusted present value. I am going to give a brief background of what the adjusted present value is all about, and then we shall start attempting the question, uh, Burun Company. So, when we talk about the investment appraisal, <clears throat> so this investment appraisal, we study various techniques at the F9 level, but when it comes to this uh, AFM P4 level, what actually happens is that uh, uh, the the there is an advanced stage technique and that is actually termed as the adjusted present value the advanced stage technique is actually termed as adjusted present value now what exactly is this adjusted present value so there are actually various limitations of npv technique there are various limitations of the npv technique now when i talk about the various limitations of the npv technique so basically what happens is the biggest limitation of the NPV technique is the use of weighted average cost of capital. Now what are those uh, limitations with respect to the use of weighted average cost of capital? So weighted average cost of capital is calculated like this. The cost of equity multiplied by market value of equity divided by market value of equity plus market value of debt plus the cost of debt one minus T multiply by market value of debt divided by market value of equity plus market value of debt. So this is how we calculate the weighted average cost of capital. 
when we apply the NPV technique, when we apply the NPV technique, then what we do is that we use the weighted average cost of capital to discount the cash flows. I'm going to explain a few things that how do we how do we actually handle this? Uh, what exactly is the limitation in using the VAC? The first of them is basically the market value of equity and the market value of the debt. The market value of equity and the market value of the debt, they keep on uh, changing over a period of time. They keep on changing over a period of time. Let's say if there is a four year project, let's say year one till four. So the market value of equity and the market value of the debt of the company would not remain constant during that time period. So if the market value of equity and market value of debt would not remain constant over a period of time. So what we are actually doing is we are actually discounting the cash flows using the VAC, which is calculated at time period zero. But the cash flow, but the but the VAC incorporates the equity and the debt value, which is not going to remain same entire over the entire life of the project. So basically what happens is the changing value of equity, the changing value of the debt is not accounted for in this VAC. That's the number one limitation. The number two limitation is basically the tax rate could keep on changing. The cash flows that we use, the cash flows uh, have a different tax rate. The cash flows have a different tax rate, but the VAC does not have a different tax rate. But the VAC tax rate is same. VAC tax rate is same. So that is another problem that actually arises. So I'm gonna repeat again that the tax rate for the VAC is the same, which is the time period zero tax rate. But in practicality, the tax rate could change for the various uh, periods and the cash flows for the various periods uh, would be subject to different rate of tax. So that would also be a problem. And lastly, if we have a debt which is repayable over time, if we have a debt which is repayable over time, so what actually happens is that if the debt is repayable over time, so your overall uh, cost of debt also changes your market value of the debt also changes. And unfortunately, when we use the weighted average cost of capital, we don't consider that changing uh, level of debt, the changing level of cost of debt, etc., etc., etc. So in order to overcome these limitations of VAC, the APV technique is introduced. And when we talk about the APV technique, what is APV, the adjusted present value? Adjusted present value is basically base case NPV. Adjusted present value is base case NPV plus present value of financing side effects plus present, wing, present value of financing side effects. So when we talk about the APV, it's actually the base case NPV plus the present value of the financing side effects. Now, what is this base case NPV? What is the present value of financing side effect? Let's discuss. The base case NPV actually means the NPV calculated on the assumption. Base case NPV actually means the NPV calculated on the assumption. that entity is 100% equity funded. That is, the entity is 100% equity funded. I'm repeating it again. When we talk about the calculation of the APV, so the APV is calculated this way that we assume uh, the APV means uh, base case NPV, which is the NPV calculated on the assumption that the entity is 100% equity funded. Okay, so when we talk about this NPV, uh, it's the NPV calculated on the assumption that the entity is 100% equity funded. Now what next is that? Then when we talk about this present value of financing side effects, so let's discuss. 
this is another area which is the present value of financing side effects which i'm actually going to discuss in a while first of all let's discuss that when we talk about the npv calculated on the assumption that the entity is 100 percent equity funded so what do we mean by this there are actually two ways of dealing this scenario there are actually two ways of dealing this scenario one of the ways is the use of mm2 one of the ways is the use of mm2 now you may ask a question that what exactly do you mean by using mm2 so i'm going to give you an idea that uh, how do we use mm2 to it if you go to this uh, exam paper you would find that the formula sheet of the examination the formula sheet of the examination it contains uh, the formula sheet of the examination it contains this mm2 formula so i'm going to discuss this mm2 formula uh, right now so that uh, you people can have a better idea that how do we actually uh, apply the mm2 formula so the first thing is the adjusted present value is calculated on the assumption that the entity is 100 percent equity funded Okay, now let's see. So when we talk about this specific formula sheet, so you have got this MM2 uh, formula and the formula of this MM2 is basically, uh, if you look at this specific formula, it's actually KE is equivalent to KE1 plus TKE, uh, et etc. et cetera. Now, what exactly do we mean by this? So one of them is basically if we have to calculate the APV one of the formula is the MM2 which you could use and uh, through this MM2 you could actually calculate the ungeared cost of equity. You could calculate the ungeared cost of equity of the entity. You could calculate what ungeared cost of equity. Now what is the next situation? The next situation is you could use the CAPM which is the capital asset pricing model and the capital asset pricing models formula is the cost of equity is risk free rate of return plus the equity beta multiplied by RM minus RF. Now I'm going to demonstrate to you that how are these formulas going to be applicable for the computation of the APV. Now let's discuss. <clears throat> when we talk about this uh, capital asset pricing model, so the one thing in the capital asset pricing model is basically this RF is the risk free rate of return. RF is the risk free rate of return. The equity beta, this is this PE is the equity beta, and this equity beta is actually risk coefficient this equity beta is actually risk coefficient then you have got rm which is the market rate of return rm is actually the market rate of return and when we talk about rm minus rf this is actually considered to be risk premium when we talk about rm minus rf this is actually considered to be market risk premium now 
So as I mentioned that the equity beta is actually the risk coefficient. So there are actually three types of betas that are available. Now what are those three type of beta? So the three types of beta are actually asset beta, uh, debt beta, and the third one of them is the equity beta. Now what is the difference between this asset beta, debt beta, and the equity beta? So asset beta, gives you business risk the debt beta gives you financial risk and the equity beta includes both uh, the equity beta includes both what the financial risk plus the business risk it includes both the financial risk plus the business risk now let's discuss The dead beta is considered to have a value of zero because generally speaking, because generally speaking, the risk associated with the debt is considered to be negligible. So generally speaking, the dead beta is considered to be zero. So the asset beta and the equity beta are connected through a formula. And what is that formula through which they are connected? This is the formula through which they are connected. I'm going to copy this formula and I'm going to discuss this formula. Okay, now see. So the formula is actually like this where you have got this asset beta this asset beta is equivalent to value of equity divided by value of equity plus value of debt multiplied by 1 minus t multiplied by equity beta multiply by equity beta plus this uh, value of debt multiply 1 minus t divided by value of equity plus value of debt multiply 1 minus t and debt beta now let's discuss let's talk so when we assume that the dead beta has a value of zero so basically this whole bracket becomes a zero value and we are left with this formula asset beta is equal to market value of equity divided by market value of equity plus market value of debt one minus t multiplied by equity beta so generally what happens is <clears throat> when we talk about the apv the first thing that we did was we said that the APV requires you to calculate the base case NPV. And what is this base case NPV? Base case NPV is the NPV calculated on the assumption that the entity is 100% equity funded. So I mentioned that how would you actually go about it? So there are two ways of doing it. One of them is a CAPM way and the other one of them is MM2 way. So I'm discussing the CAPM way. So I discussed that the equity beta there are three types of beta asset beta debt beta and the equity beta now if the company is 100% equity funded if the company is 100% equity funded then the asset beta is going to be this equity means 1 divided by 1 plus 0 into 1 minus whatsoever let's say 30% multiply by uh, whatsoever that you do um, So resultingly what happens is resultingly what would happen is the equity beta of this type of a company would be equivalent to the asset beta so if a company which is 100 percent equity funded so its equity beta would be equivalent to its asset beta resultingly what we are going to do is that in order to calculate the base case npv we are going to discount the cash flows with the cost of equity which is calculated using the asset beta so if you need to calculate the apv for the calculation of the apv the base case npv is discounted using ke which is calculated using the asset beta so for basically the formula becomes ke is equal to risk free rate of return plus the asset beta multiplied by rm minus rf so that is one way of uh, using this The second approach is to use the formula of MM2. 
now what exactly is the formula of mm2 so if i talk about the formula of mm2 the formula of mm2 is actually like this the formula of mm2 is like this where you have this is a geared cost of equity and this is ungeared cost of equity and the other thing is this is market value of debt and this is the market value of equity now what we are going to do now first is that before we go on calculating the entire adjusted present value the first step that i would want to go about is the calculation of the base case npv and then i am going to explain to you people how the present value of financing side effects come into play so the first step is the base case npv now let's discuss let's talk uh kindly go through this question then we will discuss so just go through this question please and then we shall discuss
Okay, let's uh, start discussing. Uh, it says you have recently commenced working for Bureau and Company. You have recently commenced working for Bureau and Company, and uh, and you are reviewing a four-year project which the company is considering for investment. The project is in a business activity which is very different from Bureau and Company's current line of business. Somebody was asking me a question that. Somebody was asking me a question that how do we decide if we have to use APV or we have to use NPV? So it might actually be mentioned in the question requirement or at times what happens is when you go into another business, so your business risk changes. APV is also relevant in that scenario also. Now next situation is it says the following NPV estimate has been made for the project. <clears throat> now what are those NPV estimates? It says number one of them is basically uh, all figures. All figures are in dollar million time period 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Sale revenue is given direct project cost is given the interest has been deducted. We know that the interest is an irrelevant cost. It's not deducted when you perform the calculation for the NPV. You don't deduct interest. The profit is there. The tax of 20% is imposed. The investment or sale is mentioned here. The cash flows are there. Discount factor. It says the NPV is negative 1.65. And therefore, the recommendation is that the project should not be accepted. Now, what exactly are the uh, notes to the NPV appraisal project. Let's see. It says in calculating the NPV, the following notes were made. Since the real cost of capital is used to discount cash flows, neither the sales revenue nor the direct project costs have been inflated. It is estimated that the inflation applicable to sales is 8% per year and to the direct project cost is 4% per year. Now let's try to understand one thing. If the exam would have mentioned the same rate of inflation, let's say 4% would have been applicable for all of them, then it would have been okay to use the real uh, cost of capital and the real cash flows. Because the problem is that, because the problem is that the rate of inflation is different. I'm repeating it again. The rate of inflation is different. So resultingly, what is actually gonna happen is, if the rates of the inflation are different, then resultingly what is actually going to happen is that uh, you can't use the real cash flows. You have to use the nominal cash flow. So that is also one of the mistakes that is done. So we'll have to use nominal cash flow. The next it says the project will require an initial investment of 38 million of this 16 relates to plan and machinery, which is expected to be sold for four. After taking any taxation and inflation impact into account. So that means this is correctly mentioned here. Now, it says tax allowable depreciation is available on the plant and machinery at 50% in the first year, followed by 25% per year thereafter on a reducing balance basis. A balancing adjustment is available in the year the plant and machinery is sold. Buren pays 20% tax on its annual taxable profit. No tax allowable depreciation is available on the remaining investment assets and they have nil value at the end of the project. So basically, the depreciation hasn't been accounted for so the depreciation also needs to be accounted for in this specific scenario. It says bearing either uh, uses either a nominal cost of capital of 11% or a real of 7% So nominal needs to be used. And general inflation is 4%. It says interest is based on bearing's normal rate of 150 basis points over 10 year government yield curve. So yield curve plus 1.5% is your interest cost. Now what next is there? It says at the beginning of each year. I'm repeating it again. It says at the beginning of each year, Bureau and Company will need to provide working capital of 20% of the anticipated sales revenue for the year. Any remaining will be released at the end of the project. So they haven't even considered the working capital in their calculation. They haven't considered the working capital in their calculation. <clears throat> It says working capital 
and depreciation have not been taken into account in the NPV calculation above since depreciation is not a cash flow and all the working capital is returned at the end of the project. So they have not considered that. Lastly, it says it is anticipated that the project will be funded by debt. So there are something with respect to financing, but we would read it again. It says the project will be financed entirely by a debt. 60% of which will be obtained from subsidized loan scheme. Uh, run by government issue costs are going to be this 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 remaining 40% funds will be from the Broome's normal borrowing sources. It says Borong has identified a company which is Lintu company which operates in the same line of business as that of the project. It is considering Lintu is financed by 40 million shares trading at 3.2, 34 million debt trading at 94. Lintu's equity beta is 1.5. Current yield curve is 2 and it is estimated market risk premium is 8%. The tax is 20%. Both Borong and Lintu pay tax in the same year when the profits are earned. Now, it's a 15 mark requirement. And you need to handle it tactfully. How would you handle it tactfully? So in order to handle it tactfully, the approach that you should adopt is you should you should you should actually go one by one. Now one of the marks that are there in this question is to calculate the NPV with corrections. The other is to calculate the relevant discount rate. So we get the base case NPV. We get the base case NPV. Then the third situation is we get the base case NPV. Then the third situation is basically we need to use uh, the financing side effects. So these are the three things that actually need to be rectified. So it is suggested in the exam that you handle each one of them one by one. <clears throat> the first thing that I'm actually going to do is that I'm going to calculate the discount rate. So in order to calculate the discount rate, let's discuss, let's talk. First of all, you need to calculate the asset beta of Lin2. So in order to calculate the asset beta, the formula is equity beta multiplied by market value of uh, equity divided by market value of equity plus market value of debt 1 minus T. So if I talk about it, the first one of them is basically uh, the market value of equity is going to be calculated like this. You have 40 million shares and each share is trading at 3.2. Each share is trading at 3.2. For the market value of the debt, the calculation is going to be 34 million of debt. Each bond is trading at 94%. So each hundred dollar bond is trading at 94. Resultingly, you would have the market value of debt. Now the equity beta, the equity beta is basically what? 1.5. The equity beta is what? 1.5. So we need to calculate the asset beta in total. So how much does it turn out to be? Can somebody please confirm? Okay, so the asset beta is 1.25. The relevant cost of equity is going to be, you have the risk-free rate of return, which is 2% plus 1.25 multiplied by the market risk premium is given to us.
and it is actually eight percent. It is actually eight percent. So how much is the overall KE? It's twelve percent. So this is the KE to be used. Okay, now <clears throat> so one of the aspect is done, which is the relevant discount rate is calculated in which we have incorporated the we have assumed that the entity is 100% equity funded. Now we need to rectify the calculations of the NPV. We need to rectify the calculations of the NPV. So what I'm actually going to do is that in order to make things uh, easy, I would uh, switch to the Excel mode uh, because uh, so that um, so that we could have a quick calculation because at times I do get stuck in order to wait for the answers from uh, uh, you people. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use the Excel so that I can uh, solve this in a better manner. Okay, <clears throat> so what we actually need to do is that we need to calculate the uh, corrected uh, cash flows because once we have the corrected cash flows, then the things are going to become easy for us. <laughs> Okay, let's actually discuss. So we have got uh, sales. We have got sales. And uh, then what we have is we have uh, direct project costs. We have sales and then we have got this direct project costs. And what else do we have? We have uh, the interest needs to be eliminated. So basically time period uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Okay, so the selling price uh, is subject to an inflation of 8%. The sales in the year 1 are expected to be 23.03. You need to multiply this with 1.08. And the sales here in the year two are expected to be 36.06. And what we need to do is that we need to multiply them with 1.08 power two because there is actually going to be a compounding effect of the inflation that would be applied to the cash flows. Then if I move forward, so there is actually going to be this 49.07 multiply by 1.08 power three. And lastly, you have got 27.14 and it's going to be multiplied with 1.08 power 4. So this is what you have got. You've got the sales for time period 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now let's discuss about the direct project costs. We are being told that the direct project costs are basically um, growing by uh, 2%. Uh, by growing by 4%. So it's actually going to be 
13.82 multiply by 1.04 uh, that is what it is going to be for the time period one For the time period two it is going to be 21.96 multiply by 1.04 uh, uh, power 2. The third one of them is going to be 29.44 multiply by 1.08 power 3. And the fourth is going to be 16.28 multiply by 1.04 power 4. So this is what we have as a direct project cost. Now what next is there? Uh, we are expected to have uh, depreciation. So we need to incorporate the concept of depreciation here. The depreciation in the first year is expected to be 50% of the cost of the asset, which is the, peep, which is the plan and machinery. So it's going to be 16 into 0.5. Next situation is, if it is going to be 16 into 0.5, followed by 25% per year thereafter. So it is actually going to be, the remaining net book value is 8 million, multiply by 0.25 is what it is going to be, and then multiply by 0.75 of this. And lastly, the depreciation for the final year is going to be, we need to consider, We need to consider the gain and loss on disposal or uh, I'm just going to consider that uh, what is going to be the depreciation in the final year. It is going to be multiplied by 0 0.75. So these are the depreciation. So then you have the taxable profits. You have the taxable profits. The taxable profits are uh, this minus this and minus this So we have the taxable profits for the various time period Then you have got tax at the rate of uh, What is the tax rate the tax is at the rate of 20% So this is actually going to be this multiply by 0.2 So this is what the tax is going to be Then you have got the depreciation which needs to be added back because it's a non-cash item. So the depreciation needs to be added back because it's a non-cash item. Then what happens is we have got the working capital. Now what is the examiner told us? The examiner has told us that the working capital requirement is going to be 20% of the anticipated sales. I'm going to tell you people that how do we go about with the working capital requirement. It's basically this is the time period. This is the sales. This is the working capital. And this is the incremental effect on the working capital. So this is time period one, two, three, and four. Uh, the sales are expected to be this. The sales are expected to be this. And the sales are expected to be this. And the sales are expected to be this for the various time periods. The working capital requirement is expected to be 20% of the sale. So the incremental is this. This is what we do is that we believe that this amount of working capital is already invested. Okay. Um, thank you, Karan. I'm just going to, okay, yes, I've made a mistake here. It should have been 4%. It should not have been 8%, right? Anyways, so the working capital that you need to do is that the requirement of year zero's working capital, year one's working capital would be input at uh, time period zero. 
then what happens is this is going to be here then it is going to be here and then lastly what is going to happen is and the at the end of the day everything is going to be recovered so this is how the working capital requirements would go about this is how the working capital requirements would go about Okay, so once we have working capital, then there is this investment. So the investment is going to be what? The investment is going to be 38. And at the end, there is going to be a residual value of 4. Okay, so then what we have is we have the cash flows. Am I? Am I, I hope that I'm not missing out anything. And I hope that I'm I'm clear to everybody. Okay, uh, Karan, I have rectified it. Uh, the discount factor at 12%. The discount factor is 12%. So if I say 12%, let's see. Okay, so we have got the base case NPV, uh, which is actually going to be this 8.296. Okay, is it okay to everybody? Okay, thank you. Now let's move forward. <clears throat> so the first step that we had was to calculate the base case NPV and we have done that. So the base case NPV is 8.296 million. It's 8.296 million. Now let's move forward. Uh, morally, if uh, there is actually going to be a loss after deducting the depreciation, then such loss needs to be carried forward. Such loss needs to be carried forward. Okay, let's discuss. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
well it depends you can either carry it forward or you could actually uh, have an alternate way which is that there could be an assumption that the entity has sufficient profits elsewhere uh, to claim these losses so that could also be done The steam for sure I will discuss. Don't worry about that. Okay, now let's discuss. The next situation is the concept of present value of financing side effects. What we have done up till now is that we have assumed that the project is 100% equity funded, but we do know that this is not how it is. We do know that this is not how it is. So what are we going to do now? So the present value of financing side effect, the concept of this present value of financing side effect is that whatever way that you are going to finance the project, you need to actually, you need to actually, uh, you need to incorporate the relevant uh, cost. You need to actually incorporate the cost of financing. Now, there are various aspects. The number one of them is called the issue cost. So when we obtain loan, when we obtain, when we issue shares, there are generally some issue costs that you need to bear. I am repeating it again. When we when we obtain some loan or when we issue some shares, there are generally the issue costs that we bear. So when we talk about the issue costs that we bear, I ask me just wait for a while. I'm gonna come back to you. So when we talk about these issue costs, so generally speaking, what happens is uh, the issue cost on loan or you could say the debt are tax deductible. And the issue cost on the equity instrument are not tax deductible, are not tax deductible. Now, so what are we going to do? We are going to say that uh, if the issue cost on the loan are tax deductible and the issue costs on the equity are not tax deductible. So uh, generally speaking, what you need to do is that you need to understand that how much is the issue cost. So whatever the issue cost that is shown as an outflow and whatever the tax savings that you get on the issue cost that's shown as an inflow. So you get the net issue cost. So that is one of the aspects. That is one of the aspects. Now, let's talk about the other one, which is actually the tax savings due to interest <clears throat> so assume that uh, if you have taken a loan which is let's say 10 percent hundred thousand dollar loan for a period of four years assume that what is actually going to happen is uh, the tax rate prevalent is assumed that 20 percent so what would happen is you would have interest expense from year one till year four of this 10,000 and the tax savings at the rate of 20% would turn out to be 2000. The discount factor from year one till year four would be used 
Now the question mark that arises is what is the discount rate that we are going to use? So there could actually be two discount rates. Either you could use KD or you could use RF. I'm repeating it again. Either you could use KD or you can use RF. Now when we use KD, what is our assumption? Our assumption is that we are we when we use KD, our assumption is that since the debt has a tax rate of 10%, so the relevant discount rate is also 10%. And when we use RF, let's say 2%, so our assumption is since the government is providing the tax saving, therefore the government's rate is to be used. So the government rate is to be used. Okay, <clears throat> now what next is there? The third one of them is basically in case if we have got subsidized loans, I'm repeating it again. In case if we have got subsidized loans, so what happens with the subsidized loans is that uh, when we have these subsidized loans, so what happens with these subsidized loans is that. Uh, the market interest rate may be 10% and you would have gotten a loan at let's say 6%. So there is actually a 4% interest saved. So what we generally do is that we say that the interest saved and then extra tax on it so resultingly that's the net interest saved. Resultingly, that's an end interest saved and we discount them accordingly. Lastly, the fourth one of them is basically spare debt capacity. Now, what do we mean by spare debt capacity? At times what happens is due to undertaking a project, your debt capacity increases. Now, what is this debt capacity? This is the ability to borrow. So the debt capacity is your ability to borrow. So when we say that our debt capacity increases, so this actually means, what does it actually mean? It actually means that our ability to borrow has actually enhanced. Now, resultingly, what is actually going to happen? Resultingly, whatever the amount of extra tax saving that we could get because of that debt, we would incorporate that. So I've discussed with you that uh, what are the financing side effects. So basically, if we talk about the calculation of APV, how do we calculate the APV? It's the base case NPV. It's the base case NPV and then present value of financing side effects. And then the present value of financing side effects one by one we incorporate that so it could actually be issue cost it could actually be the tax saving due to interest subsidized loan etc 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 is it okay to everybody is everybody okay with these Okay, now what I would want you people is that you should try to attempt this question and try to calculate the financing side effects of this question. Try to calculate the financing side effects of this question.
calculate financing side effects of this question. You can take five minutes and you can calculate financing side effects.
Okay, so we are uh, gonna commence in uh, just uh, five more minutes. Uh, we'll continue with this question in five minutes time.
Okay, now see. So if in this question we are actually going to talk about that, how would the financing side effects be incorporated? Okay, it says it's anticipated that the project will be financed entirely by debt. 60% of which will be obtained from a subsidized loan scheme run by the government. So the entire project would be financed by debt 60% from the subsidized scheme. So how much is the amount of finance uh, that is actually needed? So it's 38 million which is needed. So of the 38 million, 60%, how much is the 60% amount? Will be financed by the subsidized loan. And that subsidized loan scheme run by government, which lends uh, money at a rate of 100 basis points uh, below the 10 year government debt yield rate of 2.5%. So, what it does is that uh, <sighs> So this is actually going to be at 1.5 percent 100 basis points below the 10 year government debt yield rate issue costs related to the finance are 2 percent of the gross finance required. So issue costs are going to be 2 percent of it. The remaining 40 percent will be borrowed uh, from the normal borrowing sources. And uh, what is the normal rate of interest that we pay? So we are being told in the question that the normal rate of interest that we actually pay is 150 basis point above which is 2.5 percent plus 1.5 percent which is 4 percent so the normal is 4 percent now so first thing is let's talk about the issue cause so we are not been given anything that uh, what is the status of the issue cost if it is tax deductible or not so we could take an assumption that the issue cost would be tax deductible so 38 million so it is actually going to be 38 million multiply by 2% which is the issue cost. So how much does it turn out to be? How much does it turn out to be? Okay, 0 0.76 million. I'm saying that there's going to be a tax saving at the rate of 20% the relevant tax rate. So if it is going to be there, then how much is the tax saving? Okay, 0 0.152 and what is the net amount? Zero point six zero eight. Okay, now what else is there? So this is actually the issue cost. Then the second one of them is basically the tax savings due to interest. So one of them is a normal loan. The loan is 38 million multiplied by 40%, multiplied by 4%. How much is the interest there? interest can somebody please okay interest is again 0 0.608 okay so the tax saving due to interest uh, is actually going to be this is the interest the tax savings on it at the rate of 20 percent turns out to be how much
ओके पॉइंट वन टू वन सिक्स जीरो पॉइंट वन टू वन सिक्स सो इफ दिस इज एक्चुअली गोइंग टू बी पॉइंट वन टू वन सिक्स देन वॉट एल्स इज देर so basically what we would do is that uh, the discount factor here 1 till 4 the nut factor at the rate of how much percent you should use the relevant kd so that is actually going to be 4% well there are two things you can either use rf or you can either use uh, the relevant kd so the kd is used on the assumption that this loan is subject to this rate so the tax saving would be subject to this xyz rate yes you can do it but the point is i am not calculating the net amount i am just saying the tax saving due to interest i am not considering the interest i am just saying the tax saving due to interest yes recommended is kd Okay, can somebody please confirm what's the NUD factor of four uh, percent for the four years? Okay, so it's actually going to be point one two one six into three point six three. How much is it? Okay, so this is zero point double four one four. Now, similarly on uh, subsidized loan, it's thirty eight million multiplied by sixty percent multiplied by. It's thirty eight million multiplied by sixty percent multiplied by one point five percent. How much is it? Okay, point three four two, and what is the tax saving on this interest? Zero point double zero six zero point zero six eight four. Now say four year. NUD factor at the rate of 1.5 percent. How much is it? uh what's the four year annuity factor at 1 and 1/2 percent Three point eight five four. Okay, so how much is it overall? Zero point 
0.2636 okay 0.2636 now so what have we done up till now we have calculated the tax saving due to interest on the normal rate loan and on the subsidized rate loan the third thing is basically the interest saved due to subsidized loan interest saved due to subsidized loan so let's talk about it um we would have normally borrowed at four percent but now we have borrowed at 1.5 percent multiplied by 38 million multiplied by 60 percent so how much does it turn out to be Point five seven. The same discount factor at the rate of one point five percent, the four-year NUD factor. So what is actually going to happen is three point eight five four. How much three point eight five four? So how much does it turn out to be? Okay, 2.1967. Now, so if we talk about the APV calculation for this scenario, the APV calculation is going to be base case NPV, which is 8.29, 8.296. The base case NPV is 8.296 million. That's what the base case NPV is. And then you add the present value of financing side effects. The present value of financing side effects. So basically when we talk about the present value of financing side effects, the first thing is that the net issue cost. And then tax savings due to interest. And then lastly, net interest saved due to subsidized loans. So what was the net issue cost in total? Zero point six zero eight is the net issue cost. What is the tax saving due to interest? Uh, please uh, 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 tell about both both the loans. One of them is 0.4414, one of them is 0.2636. Okay, so how much is the total? And then there is this net interest saved due to this uh, 2.1967. So 
So resultingly, resultingly we have the APV, which turns out to be 10.590 approximately. Okay, so is everybody okay with this? Okay, there is somebody who's asking a question that uh, what do you do with the gross part which they have mentioned? Uh, problem with the gross part they have mentioned in the question about the issue cost of the, well, when it says the issue cost of the gross finance required, that means whatever the total finance that's needed for the business, that is going to be, the issue cost is going to be applicable on that, that means uh, at times, usually what happens is that uh, we come across situations where we are being told that the uh, loan from the government is not subject to issue cost. So here, basically, when it says gross finance required, that means even the loan from the government would be subject to the issue cost. Okay, so we are actually done with this specific question and uh, I can actually, uh, I mean the, the, the formula that we use in this specific situation for the APV was uh, the capital asset pricing model, but you could come across a situation where you're not given the betas or things like that. So in that circumstances, what you would do is that you would use this formula of Modiglani and Miller. So basically the KE ungeared needs to be calculated from the formula if you come across uh, such a thing in the in the future. Uh, well, nothing is must in the exam of Smanshada that can come, it cannot come. I mean, you can't actually uh, predict and I don't, I'm not in a mood to predict anything at all. Um, so. Anyway, so we are done with this question. The second requirement of the question was, it says that comment on the corrections made to the original NPV calculations, uh, present value estimate, explain the APV adjustment, etc., etc. Now, um, what I'm actually going to do now is that I'm going to use this uh, some time that is uh, left for the session. So I'm actually going to guide you people that uh, how could you go about for the preparation of the uh, exams and what are the areas that you must uh, actually practice I shall inshallah be sharing out uh, one of the uh, one of the list for the um, uh, for the important questions to practice also I'm going to share that uh, probably on the Facebook and on the WhatsApp group uh, but I'm just going to guide you people a bit about how you could actually speed up your calculations 
Uh, my suggested approach is going to be first of all you do the basic VAC. In fact, the complete VAC. Uh, you do the investment appraisal uh, concepts. And then uh, you do this uh, mergers and acquisition basic concepts. And then the restructuring and the reconstruction basic concept. This is the first thing that you should do. The best way to prepare for these uh, areas is that you prepare them and then you try to attempt uh, the questions between question two to four. Ideally speaking, you should attempt at least two questions for each area. So ideally that makes it four areas. So that makes it eight questions. And then what you should do is that you should attempt. Once you have done this, then you should attempt question number one, at least six questions from the past papers. Because usually what happens is the past paper questions uh, which are there with these four areas, which is the VAC, investment appraisal, merger acquisition, restructuring. These questions usually have uh, these questions usually have these four topics which are which are tested uh, in tandem. They are tested together. I mean, uh, you would come across questions where these topics would be tested together with each other. So you don't have uh, much of a segregation. It's completely integrated testing that is done. So you could actually prepare these topics first. Then you could actually uh, prepare at least two questions from each topic from the section B of the exams. And then you attempt at least six questions of question one. And ideally, uh, it sh all of them should be the latest questions. Now, the next step is basically the risk management. So the good thing to do about the risk management is um, there are there are comprehensive questions for the currency risk. And the comprehensive risk uh, question for the interest rate risk. So at least two questions from section B for each and then you should try to do at least three questions from section A. If you get through these areas, that means you would be done with around 75% preparation for the exams. Now, what's the next thing? Ideally speaking, all the theory parts of the questions what you should do is that there are two types of theories that are tested one of them is a connected theory which is to connect it to the exam question and the other theory is basically a theory which is generally a bookish knowledge so what you should do is that you should go through maximum exam question you should read through the answers of the question and get hold of the various uh, theoretical aspects that are discussed and for the connected theories, just see that how they are connecting the computations with the theoretical aspects so that you can give you can get a good idea that uh, how how is this uh, how is this actually all making sense? So and lastly, one thing that you could do is that you could access to latest uh, last three years examiners articles which are there on the ACCA website. So if you access last three years articles, uh, it would it would actually be very fruitful very beneficial for you So I think that uh, Don't don't uh, actually set yourself very optimistic targets Just try to stay within the limits don't actually bother for a small areas of the syllabus Just focus on the major concept and even if you come into the exam and you come across a situation where the question becomes very tough Just try to split the question into parts. Just try to attempt the smallest part of the question which could be like in this APV we attempted the question. It could have been just the correction of the cash flows. It could have been just the calculation of the VAC because once you start attempting even a smallest part of the question, then the things start to move uh, in your direction. Then the things they start to move in your direction and you you actually slowly gradually move forward. Okay, so I think uh, this is uh, enough. Anybody wants to know any question? Anybody wants to ask anything?
Okay, Elias and R for the report structure, it's quite simple. Uh, you just need to understand there are two things, three things with respect to the report, and that are actually number one of them is uh, you should actually have uh, the uh, the initial uh, thing, which is uh, to from at the same time date and subject. You'll get one mark for doing this. Then you should actually give an introduction section. And what you need to do is that you just need to reword the question requirement. You just need to reword the question requirement uh, in this introduction para. You get one mark for that. Then lastly, you go for the conclusion. You get one mark for that also. And for the conclusion, you just need to you just need to uh, simplify. You just need to summarize. That's it. So these are the three marks that you could uh, you should ideally go for for the remaining for the remaining uh, body of the uh, report. Uh, it's it's very much um, it's very much uh, question mark. Okay, <clears throat> Ali S and R uh, Tasneem, how the section A must be attempted. Okay, now uh, there is a question that how should we attempt the paper? Should we attempt a question from section B or should we attempt a question from section A? So my suggestion is going to be you should attempt first section A because it's a 50 mark question and that's a maximum mark. But ideally speaking, you should focus more on the theoretical aspects of the question because one of those part which is connected to the calculations that you perform even if you get the calculations wrong and you uh, you refer uh, the wrong calculation correctly in the theory you'll still get marks also Also, the next situation is uh, this is one thing is done. The next situation is uh, attempt. I mean, don't waste, uh, don't waste time. Uh, don't waste a lot of time on the question. Uh, if you don't know anything, just just skip that part. Just move forward because 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 you should try to invest more time onto the things that you should know. I mean, it's good. It's always good to attend the complete paper, but uh, it's not. It's not worthwhile investing or wasting time onto the things which you actually don't know at all. Ali S and R, uh, you can start with appendix. That's fine. I mean, you see, there are four marks available for the report, and you can easily get two marks. And I think the remaining two marks you should not go for. <laughs> That's what you should do. Yasmin, I would recommend. Don't worry, I would share those on Facebook and on WhatsApp. Osman Shadad, there is no session tomorrow. Uh, it's the final session today. You could listen to the you could listen to the earlier sessions by logging on to Vimeo.com. Okay, so I would really appreciate if you people could share your feedback, overall feedback for the session, uh, the total of uh, four days that we have had together. If you could share the feedback, so that is actually going to help a lot to me and to the ACCA team also. And uh, we would, we would, we would be highly, we would highly appreciate if you could share your feedback, please. <laughs> Mohammed Hamid, yes. Uh, 
uh, thank you Shelly Devi would uh, also appreciate if you could uh, have a complete feedback over the entire webinar session please uh, I would appreciate others to also please uh, comment as uh, your feedback your comments are important for us Tasneem, uh, you see the that is that is what makes uh, a paper challenging. Um, so uh, every question could be different. It it is, but the point is you should know the basic concepts right, and then you can handle all types of question. And the more and more practice that you do in a proper manner, that would help you clarify the concept. Uh, thank you, Kushal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nabil Anjum. Jasmine, thank you. Shelly Devi, that's so nice of you. Thank you very much uh, for a complete review of the overall session. Smita, thank you very much. Ali Asandar, yes, I could understand that uh, when I started off uh, with this uh, um, foreign exchange, uh, I started off uh, assuming that people know it very well. But unfortunately, it wasn't like that. But thank God that you people have stopped me and I actually, um, <laughs> actually went the way it actually was uh, fruitful for all of them. Uh, Tasneem, thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, response. Uh, may Allah bless you also. Yeah, Tasneem, please, please share, share, share. Would be very helpful. Palavi, thank you. Thank you very much, Palavi Mithal. Uh, Baita, I think I am unable to. Uh, I'm unable to pronounce your name correctly, but um, 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 you you can get the handouts. I'm gonna share them on the WhatsApp link. Don't worry about that. Mary Claire, don't worry. Uh, it's all recorded, then you can uh, get access to it on the website. Uh, Yasmin, for free calculation interest rate on something we don't do it. Net of tax. For the subsidized loan, yes, we do net of tax. We, I mean, you see, for the subsidized loan, we do two things. One of them is we calculate the we calculate the tax saving due to interest, and then second, we say net interest saved due to loan. Osman Sajad, uh, highly appreciated. Uh, Tasneem, yes, I would do that. Don't worry. Thank you for your feedback. Okay, uh, thank you very much everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, attending these sessions and I hope and pray that uh, all of you would inshallah score a pass uh, in this uh, AFM. For many of you, it might actually be the last paper towards qualification. Um, one thing which is most important is that you should you should have a passing attitude. And what do we mean by passing attitude? Having a passing attitude actually means that you should you should you should actually not you should not actually worry with any question in the exam you should you should just uh, handle all of them patiently so if you have a passing attitude you would you would do really well all don't bother about the small things which you may not have covered they they don't really actually let leads towards the failure thank you Tasneem. thank you everybody 
uh, uh, wish you all the best. Thank you.